So this evening, the guided meditation, with more reflective suggestions. The important thing is the is the, is the actual doing of it. I mean, when you think about meditation, and you get caught in endless doubts, should I do anapanasati, sweeping? Sound of silence, metta, should I count or not count or use mantra or then the thing is to just, the point is to do it. Is a, so like with one upon a sudden you just go to the breath, you know. With the sweeping, just go to the sensations of the body. So it's, a, it's an act of, it's a, it's a kind of, the important thing is doing it rather than trying to figure out what you should do or how you should do it, whether you're doing it right or whether you're doing it wrong or, or which is the best, what is suitable for you, and what you've heard, what you've read in books, what other people tell you, and pretty soon your state of paralysis, unable to move. So it's just it's like with, with um, going right to the breath. Remember that the Pachubana, the Pachubana Dhamma, the here and now, is a, a stab, samruam, this collecting on one point, this present moment, uh, being here with the way it is. So we start from from very obvious things the way they are. The breath is like this. Sensations, bodily sensations as we sweep through the surface of the body, the, from the top of the head down to the soles of the feet. The sound of silence, here and now, isn't it? The, the cosmic primordial sound. Here and now. Then they, so this, these are, these are the, the, what I call, what I use as a basis. When I don't know what to do, then I just go, right, sometimes I'll just use the sound of silence. Just tune into that. Or, if I want something to do, then I sweep through the body. And relax, if I feel the body's tense or, I um, you know, feel tensions or kind of discomfort, physical discomfort. And I, I spend a lot of time just sweeping the body in this attitude of metta. And then uh, to, to sharpen up the uh, concentration on the panasati and get into a kind of refinement of tranquility. Then the attitude of metta is, uh, as I was saying last night, it says, total acceptance, non-judgmental, unconditioned love. They use, they use unconditioned love. And they said love is, isn't Liking, no, not not approving. It doesn't necessarily mean approving or liking. It means love is the ability to accept things for what they are. So when we lack, when we're not, when we're not, when we when we uh, are not in this state of awareness, then then our life is very much uh, picking and choosing, making. Judgments of, I don't like this, this shouldn't be, this person shouldn't be like this, I shouldn't think like this, they should, uh, shouldn't act like that, the government shouldn't be like this, uh, they should be like something else. So uh, then we, I can't possibly love somebody who, uh, says, uh, 
ins- who is so insensitive and cruel in their behavior. I can't possibly love somebody like that. And, and we go on and on endlessly in terms of approval and disapproval, liking and disliking, calling the, and thinking love is something that that is uh, synonymous to liking or approving. Where well, it's unconditioned love or metta, no conditions on it. I mean, no, there's no deals you're making. Whether somebody's uh, being absolutely rotten and stupid and horrible, it doesn't destroy the love. No matter what you're thinking or how bad you've been in the past or whatever. It's not, it's not a matter of destroying or, or uh, perverting or disrupting love because it's unconditioned in this attitude of metta. It is isn't I love you if you act in the, in the, in the proper way. That's a conditioned kind of love, isn't it? If you behave yourself, then I love you. If you do what I want, <laughs> then I love you. If you don't do what I want, then I don't love you anymore. So this is a reflection, isn't it? Uh, on, on uh, say, the, this, the grandness, the kind of all-inclusiveness of metta, So in this way, what you do happens to you in meditation. It all belongs, you know. You know, you think you're meditating wrongly because maybe you're feeling a lot of negative thoughts or you're you're not getting the results you want and so forth. And then you start doubting and thinking of yourself in negative ways or... But all they say is, in the attitude of metta, is, is total acceptance of even your wandering mind, or, or your uh, disruptive thoughts, or the rage or resentment you're feeling. It's not, not, uh, not passing any kind of value judgment like this. It's uh, just able to to bear and endure and not make it not make a problem about the quality or the state of the condition. So how do you do that? There is an attitude and then in this awareness, isn't it, this pure state of awareness. It's a transcending the condition. When you're aware of, say, a bad mood, that awareness is is not the mood, isn't it? The bad mood can't observe itself. But that which observes, the the knower, the knowing, the aware, that which is aware, the awakened one knows, the bhutto, So that's the transcendent thing, just by attention, just by paying attention to the present, whatever the condition might be. The attention is is the, is is what you take refuge in, not in the condition. Don't take any refuge in the conditions because they're all, they'll only lead to more confusion. Not a aversion to the conditions, but it's recognizing the limitation of conditioned experience. It's, it's just what it is. It can't be more than that. You can't make a condition into something that you want and and hold it and keep it that way. 
So you, you know, no longer trying to manipulate, control life because you can flow with it, because you have a refuge that contains and is patient, accepting of the condition that you're experiencing. So that's the enlightened mind. That's not something remote or distant or impossible. Seeing things in the light there's this word enlightenment. Oftentimes we, we get this idea of being blasted, like when they fla- take a picture of you with a flash, you know, and it goes right in your eyes and you can't see because the light's so blinding. But that's the kind of light that blinds. It isn't the light that makes you, that allows you to see, is it? If it's too bright, then it's, it only blinds you and you can't see anything. But if the light is awareness, isn't it? The light of awareness allows you to see everything clearly. So it's not not a blinding light. Enlightenment isn't being zapped and going into a fit over a kind of big flash of fiery light. But it's the, it's the ability to trust and rest in a state of awareness where the light is enlightening things, lightens up everything. You can, if, it, if things are lit up properly, then you can see everything for what it is. If it's too dim, then you... You can only see maybe shadows. If it's too bright, it it blinds you. So now to uh, practice going to the composing the mind, samruam, collecting your mind in the present, the breath and the posture, the sensations, and this attitude of patient, uncritical acceptance of whatever conditions you're experiencing. Using the sound of silence, or somebody referred to today as a cosmic hum, that scintillating, uh, kind of almost electric sound, background sound. So when your mind is open and relaxed, you begin to notice this. You know it going on all the time, we don't generally notice. So I found this a very useful uh, reference, because in order to hear that, to notice it, you, know, you have to be in a relaxed state of awareness. And there are people trying to find it on a description of it, and they don't, they're 
they spend, I've had people go on 10 day retreats trying to find sound of silence. Then they say, I can't hear it. <laughs> What's wrong with me? <laughs> and they, they're trying to find something. Well, if there's not something, something you have to find, it's just open to. There's more, it's listening. And as listening, ability to listen, isn't it? It's where you, your, your mind is in a receptive state. You're not trying to solve any problems or anything, you're just listening. So you're actually, uh, putting your, your mind into uh, this receptive awareness. So it's an awareness that is receiving, willing to receive whatever is. And one of the things that you begin to recognize is this sound of silence. And some people get averse to it. They think one woman started hearing it and then she wanted to stop hearing it, so she resisted. And she said, now I can't, you know, I used to have peaceful meditations, now all I hear is that blasted sound. And I'm trying to stop it. Before I never heard it, and now I, now that's all I, I sit down immediately, I go, so the, And that's, uh, what, she's creating a, aversion toward the way it is, isn't it? I don't want that. I, She's, she's creating a suffering around the sound of silence. But if you stop creating suffering, it helps to focus the mind. Uh, because the mind is in this kind of very expanded state. It's an including, it's not a, it's not a state where you're excluding anything. The sound of silence is like infinite space, it includes everything. All other sounds, everything is, 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 has this kind of sense of expansion, unlimitedness, infinity, and other sounds come and go, and change and move accordingly. But that is a kind of continuous, like a stream, and in. Uh, Last January, I was giving retreat up in Chiang Mai, in northern Thailand, in this place called Pongyang, and it is this lovely resort, mountain resort with this waterfall and stream, and they, they built the meditation all right by the stream. The sound of the waterfall and the stream is continuous. It's quite loud. I remember one somebody on the retreat, not this year, but the year before, got very averse to the sound of the stream. And I can't meditate here in Pongyang. It's too noisy. The sound of the stream is just, you know, just too much for me. Can't bear it. <laughs> Other than seeing that, you know, how if you listen, if you open your mind, to the sound, or are you going to resist it? You know, I don't like this sound. Mm -hmm. Then you, then you're fighting and resisting. That's the suffering. I noticed in Pongyang when the sound of the waterfall in the stream didn't, and the sound of silence was in the background. In fact, the sound of silence became the stronger, more obvious sound, but it didn't obliterate didn't obliterate the sound of the stream, but they kind of worked together, and, and the sound of the stream didn't obliterate and, and the disguise or cover up the sound of silence. So it's like radar, you know, you've got this kind of wide, the mind is in a very wide, expansive state of awareness. 
including, open to, including, receptive, other than shut off, closed, controlled. So notice this. You have to contemplate this experience. And then just concentrate your attention on the sound of silence. And then if you think about think of it in terms of it's like a, a blessing or something like grace or a, a love, lovely kind of uh, feeling of or sense of being blessed and being uh, opened rather than seeing it merely as if you see a buzz in the ear, then it's, then you think it's maybe something wrong with, you think it's tinnitus or some disease. But if you start contemplating it as, as uh, the sound of angels or cosmic sound, cosmic hum, primordial sound, Blessing us every moment as we open to that. We feel a sense of being blessed. And so just reflecting in this way, in a positive way towards it, helps to helps us to take an interest in it and 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 have a a very a kind of good feeling from it. You can begin to contemplate non-thinking. Because when you're just listening to the cosmic sound, there's no thought. You notice, no thought. It's like this. Emptiness. Emptiness. Uh, no self. And that when, that when you're just with this, the cosmic sound alone, there's pure attention, but there's no, no sense of a person, a personality of me, mine, anatta. Relax into the sound. Not don't try to force the tension on it. Sense of relaxing, resting, peacefulness. And then count sometimes. Just to sustain. You can count to ten. With this, listening to the sound of sound, you can think to yourself, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's a way of, of kind of sustaining because the mind is not used to, to, to resting in that way. We're used to thinking and, and restless mental activities. So it takes a while to, 
to calm and to relax and to rest in this silence of the mind. In that silence, you can also be aware of any emotions that arise. It's not an annihilating emptiness. It's not a kind of sterile nothingness. Is it? It's full. It's, it's embracing. So you can be aware of just the movements of emotion. doubt or when things start the memories or feelings start coming becoming conscious it embraces them it's not judging or resisting or even being fascinated it's, it's just recognizing realizing the way it is With the sound of silence, because we tend to use the word sound itself, or you know, perceptual conditioning of our mind, we connect sound with ears. So it's like a buzzing in the ears, maybe at first. We hear it as a buzz in the ears. Because it's just the impression of sound is always connected to the ears. But you can plug your ears up and you can still hear it. Or you can, when you're swimming underwater, you can hear the sound of silence. So what is it? And then, as it, you kind of, Realize it's more like it's everywhere rather than in the ears. That perception of it's in my head, like the mind is in the brain or the sound is in the ears. You, you see, you're changing from that kind of very conditioned way of ex- uh, experiencing through this sense of self and and the cultural condition attitudes we we hold to a much more kind of wider understanding of the way it is. It's like the perception of the mind in the body. And then through uh, intuitive awareness, what we're seeing, the, the body's in the mind. Like right now, you're in my mind. All of you. In this hall. You're in the mind. 
But on the con- on conventional level, we say <coughs> each one of us, our mind is in our head. So you're sitting over there with a mind in your head. Sister Kobe has a mind in her head. Meiji Rene has a mind in her head. Alagar Kayahu has a mind in his head. There's all these different heads with minds in them. But then, in terms of the fact that that the mind, like I'm sitting here, this body sitting up on this high seat, I can see you with my eyes. I said, you're in the mind. You're not in my head. <laughs> in, I can't say you're all in my brain. But the mind is uh, the capable is is it, there's no limit to it. So the then one begins to see the body is more like a radio, some kind of conscious entity in the universe that picks up things. You know, the, it's the being born uh, as a separate entity in the universe. We're a point of light. We're a conscious being in a separate form. But what, as a as a kind of fixed person in a as a, as a kind of solid physical person that we tend to assume, or is it something greater than that? Not so, not so limited, not so heavy, not so uh, fixed as our cultural conditioning tends to make it sound, or as we tend to perceive it. Because this sound of silence isn't—it isn't like mine or in my head, but the. This form is able to recognize it, know things as they are. This knowing isn't a cultural knowing. It's not like interpreting everything from my cultural conditioning. It's seeing things as it is in a direct way, which isn't dependent on cultural attitudes. So we begin to really see, understand anatta, non-self. We're all connected, aren't we? We're all, and there's no, we're not, we're all one really. We're not, as it appears to be, a collection of separate, totally separate entities. You start contemplating like this, yeah. Begin to expand your awareness to include rather than to define. So in the terms of meditation where you're establishing awareness on the, you, this some room in the present, collecting, recollecting, contemplating one-pointedness in the present, Pachyubhananthamma, the body, the breath, the sound of silence. The metta is an attitude of a way of relating to, uh, and recognizing condition phenomena without judging it. Because otherwise we tend to make judgments, value judgments about what we're experiencing on a personal level. You know, one person is feeling peace, the other person is feeling restless, another person is feeling 
inspired another person's feeling bored and another person's feeling uh, oh, you know high and another low or you're having good thoughts or bad thoughts or useful thoughts or stupid thoughts these are these are what judgments about the quality of, of the experience that each one is having You know, they stupid thoughts or good thoughts or bad thoughts. But in terms of knowing, isn't it? We're knowing that thought is the condition rising and ceasing. And even bad thoughts, horrible thoughts, rise and cease just like good thoughts. I mean, it's it's not a matter of of uh, passing judgment about how bad you are because you're having bad thoughts, isn't it? It's the ability to recognize thought, the nature of thought, is changing, permanent, non-self. So now just use this uh, cosmic hum, this gentle stream flowing, sense of flowing, scintillating sound. Just get familiar with it. Sometimes, like with emotional experience, and you get all kind of wound up about something, and some strong emotional feeling of being indignant <coughs> or upset by something. And you think, I'm not going to stand for that. Oh, I've had it enough. Then go into the sound of silence and count to five to ten. See what happens. <laughs> Is it that the experiment with it? <laughs> I mean, you can be here, you know, right at this moment. Oh, I'm fed up, totally fed up. I'm had enough. This is it. And then go into the silence. I used to like to do this, play with this, because. I need to suffer from indignation, exasperation. Being fed up. <laughs> I like that word fed up because you can say it with such kind of 
such you know, conviction. Fair enough. <laughs> But the way of training, training the mind, like the, this cosmic sound, the sound of silence, is, it's really a natural sound. It's, that's why when you learn to rest with it, it's a sustainable, it's not created, you know, it's not like you're creating a refined state that depends on uh, conditions supporting refined, like to, to, sustain any kind of refined conditioning, you have to have very refined conditions supporting it. You know, so you can't have coarse, raucous, noisy, loud, nasty things happening uh, when when you're and, and still sustain a, a sense of refinement in your mind. Because the conditions won't allow that. Uh, to have to have a refined mental state, you have to have a, a you know the silence or or a kind of uh, not a lot of demands, not a lot of raucous noise, no noise, no disruption, um, no quarrelling and wars and explosions and and that. With this, this very lovely kind of scene where everything's just very precious and controlled. Everybody speaks. In, when we get into that state, we all get very precious, don't we? We whisper to each other in gentle tones. And somebody says, Oh, I'm back. It really shatters us, and we get really, we get very upset because we get so sensitive in that state. And being in the in the military, you get used to coarseness. But say in in the in the, the sound of silence. Isn't you know you begin to hear it wherever you are in the in the middle of uh, London in a traffic jam in Bangkok in in a, in a heated argument with uh, somebody on the battlefield uh, in when the chainsaws gain uh, when the pneumatic drill is a, and the Lawnmower and the chainsaw are all going at one time, and <laughs> and when they uh, uh, and even in the in, in, when when there's music, you can hear it. So it's it's uh, it's learning to to detect it, isn't it? That's why it's like a challenge. You just uh, tune into it. Because sometimes you, I can't hear it now. There's too much noise. But if you relax, if you're resisting the noise, then you can't. But if you begin to open to it, then you begin to hear that gentle, scintillating hum with all the with the pneumatic drill blasting away or the chainsaw. It's, it's not. It's a. So it, it, it's like it. It's a. It integrates. It allows us to integrate mindfulness and meditation into movement, work, uh, busyness. Like if you're in the kitchen or washing dishes or walking from here back to your room or driving a car or whatever. It it works. It helps to. It it doesn't like make you heedless. It increases your. It allows you to be fully with what you're doing. 
It isn't a, it's a kind of distracting thing that, that makes you heedless if you're washing the dishes. It increases your mindfulness. It helps you to wash the dishes fully, you know, to be really with the washing of the dishes rather than just washing the dishes in your mind you're thinking about all kinds of other things. Or when you're walking from here back to your room, you can be thinking about everything else. And if you use the sound of silence, it helps to be with the walking, with walking. Be mindful and, and with the very action that's happening in the present. Sometimes the sound of silence will become very loud and quite unpleasant, but it'll, it'll, it won't stay that way. I remember one time it really was, uh, incredibly loud. It seemed to be like ear splitting. I thought, oh, something's going wrong. Then it, then it ch- changed, and then I tried to get it loud again, I couldn't. <laughs> so it's, it's something to, you know, it's not a, something that's dangerous or, I mean, how you look at it in terms of, you know, it being, you know, if you resist or negative towards it, that's something, you're creating that negativity towards it. But if you relax and open, then it, then you feel a sense of just a gentle kind of scintillating background sound is peaceful. Calming, restful. You begin to re- realize, recognize emptiness. And it's not just some vague idea about if you practice meditation, you might experience emptiness someday or anatta. You get, it's, it's not a kind of a vague kind of thing. It's very direct. And contemplate what self is in that emptiness and sadhana. And then when you become a person, when you become a personality, what happens? You start thinking, grasping your feelings, and, uh, and you become a monk or a nun or a man or a woman or a Personality, or a, or a, a Pisces, or an Aries, or a Asian, or a European, or an American, or a, an old man, or a young woman, or whatever. You through thinking, grasping at perception, Vedana Sanya Sankara. We start getting wound up into that, and then we become. But in this emptiness, there's no, there's no nationality. It's not, not English, 
particularly. English comes and goes. I comes and goes. It's a pure, uh, pure intelligence. Doesn't belong to anybody or any group. So then you start recognizing when, when you've become somebody and when there's nobody, when there's atta and there's anatta. Like in this emptiness, there's anatta, no, there's no ajang tomato right now. I want to tell you about my personal history and my, uh, my, all my qualifications and my achievements in the holy life over the past 33 years. And, uh, and tell you about all the, that I'm, um, you know, uh, this, uh, an abbot of the monastery and, um, and I'm, um, written some books and I'm considered, uh, a VIB, very important bhikkhu. And I want you to respect me and treat me properly uh, because uh, you get a lot of merit for being kind to old people. That's Ajahn Sumato. You don't have to respect me at all. You know, it doesn't matter to me in the slightest. You know, it's, uh, I can take it if you don't like me or if you criticize me and find fault with me, it's okay. I'm quite willing to bear it and, you know, of course I've sacrificed a lot for all of you. <laughs> Uh, that's our John Sumato again. Born again. <laughs> and then gone now. Empty. <laughs> so you, you can, you know, just by, by exploring this, you can to really understand, you know, what atta is, self, when you become a personality and so forth. And when, when there's no person, but there's still awareness, isn't it? It's an intelligent awareness. It's not a unconscious, dull stupidity. It's, it's bright. It's clear. Intelligent. Emptiness, and then, the, then you can see when when you become, you know, you're feeling sorry for yourself, uh, thinking about what I think. If you want my opinion, uh, let me tell you what's wrong with you. <laughs> that kind of thing. Or the self-criticism, you know, I'm, you know, here I am uh, with a lot of weaknesses and faults and and um, so forth. And then I start thinking about what's wrong with me. And then it stops and there's this silence. But there's still, the silence is a, is bright and clear, intelligent silence. And then we begin to, like I find, preferring this silence than this endless kind of proliferating uh, nattering that goes on in the mind. I used to, I used to have a, what I call an inner tyrant. <clears throat> it's a bad habit I picked up. I don't uh, of always criticizing myself. There's a real tyrant. I think nobody, there's nobody in this world that has been as tyrannical and as critical and as nasty to me as I am. 
even the most critical person that, that, who's harmed and and made me miserable has never made me as miserable, relentlessly miserable as I have. This this inner tyrant. There's a real wet blanket of a tyrant. It's always, no matter what I do, it's never good enough. It's always, you know, even if everybody says, oh, Arjun Samedo, you gave such a wonderful Desana. The inner tyrant says, no, it wasn't. You, you shouldn't have said this, and you didn't say that right. <laughs> so it seems to just go on in, in kind of endless, Perpetual of blokey, of criticism and fault finding. And, uh, and, it, and yet, it's just a habit. So I let it, I've, I've freed my mind from this habit. Doesn't, doesn't have any, doesn't, can't, doesn't have any footing anymore. If I know it, I know exactly what it is. I know, I no longer believe in it, or, or I'm not trying, trying to get rid of it. I just know not to pursue it. Let it dissolve into the silence. And that's a way of breaking these habits, a lot of these emotional habits we have that are kind of plague us and obsess our mind. You can actually train your mind to, not through rejecting or denial, but through understanding and cultivating this silence. So this silence isn't a, isn't, don't use it as a way of annihilating or getting rid of but a way of resolving, liberating your mind from, say, uh, obsessive thoughts or negative attitudes that can just kind of endlessly plague conscious experience. 